Amen. O Lord, by the light which shone upon those who were in darkness, and they were illuminated. Upon the blind, and they recovered their sight. Let your face now shine upon us, and we shall be illumined by you. Walk in the way of your gospel teachings, and glorify the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Mary, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, so we'll finish up our last points. We left off with um, St. Ephraim. And one of the things that's important about this is that we're going over these characteristics of the Syriac churches because, of course, redemption is not by birth. Redemption is by a new birth, a baptism. And so it's not a genetic connection that brings us to redemption. It's not Israel. It's the new Israel which requires that baptism and that act of faith. And of course, the beauty of the whole Syriac tradition is, is that it is a historical manner by which grace has imprinted the body of Christ. So it's very important for us to have a knowledge of how this spirituality is lived in that Syriac tradition. So we've spent, we've almost done. We have 11 points. We're on point number 10 now with St. Ephraim, and then we'll do 11. And 11 is probably the most distinct of all of them. And Part of the reason is, is because that's our spirituality. That's how the hymns themselves, the poetry, will come alive when we understand how that grace has been communicated to this church. The second thing on the psychological level, it gives us a greater stability in our faith. Because of course it turns it inwardly. When we have a better knowledge of how this faith is expressed, this Catholic faith is expressed in Mesopotamia, in the Middle East, then that becomes our personal treasure. And psychologically, because of course we have a greater sense of security, the better we know ourselves, just on a psychological level. The better that we know ourselves, the more stable we are emotionally and in our personal lives. So that's also a quality that comes, why the knowledge of the tradition is so important. And then on the the third aspect, of course, is that the Eastern Fathers insist upon the fact that we discover Christ within us by the grace working within us. That whole aspect is very important. But it doesn't mean some kind of amorphous, ethereal, non-defined blob, psychologically, of just meditating on me. It's to find the actual question of grace working within the individual. So that's very much part of, even St. Augustine in the West talks about that we find the Christ within us working. He is expressed and we receive the Christ through the sacred mysteries and that invisible objective reality. But in our personal prayer, it comes within us by that contact with Christ working within us. And therefore it's important to understand the aspects of the Aramaic um, <coughs> church because it will have that stamp of Christ working within us. So the veiled aspect, the poetry, the hiddenness, the ineffability, that whole aspect is very distinctive. So we left off with um, St. Ephraim. St. Ephraim was often known as Sori Yo-Yo. Sori Yo-Yo. St. Ephraim the Syrian. So whenever you find... Now what has happened is in Constantinople, they take Mar Ephraim Sori Yo-Yo, and they've kind of made him into a Greek monk. And so oftentimes when you see icons of St. Ephraim, unless they come from the Middle East, he'll look like a monk of prayer, which is not what he is. Ecclesiastically, he's a deacon, but he almost certainly belongs to a thing which we call the Nyai Komo, Kyomo, 
And we'll, that'll be our 11th point. Okay? Now, <clears throat> we mentioned about the fact that St. Ephraim, who dies in 373, those last 10 years of his life from 363, he's a <coughs> refugee from Nisibis. So his life is spent in Persia, essentially the Persian Empire, except for the last 10 years. We know him as being from Edessa, but he's part of this mass <coughs> movement of population from, out, from the Christians out of Nisibis going west to Edessa. It was part of the military, part of the treaty that took place between Persia and the Roman Empire. So he spends his last 10 years in Edessa. But in Edessa, the reason why we have, I think, a, a couple hundred poems of St. Ephraim. We have a lot of his writings. And the reason why we have them, why he wrote so much, is because Edessa was a churning pot of both Orthodox Christianity and a lot of heterodoxy. A lot of heretical ideas, misplaced ideas, insufficient ideas, uh, heretical ideas, um, heterodox ideas, call them whatever you want, but a lot of non-proper Christian ideas presenting themselves as Christianity. So his poetry was meant to be a way to communicate the true, correct, orthodox faith to the people in a way which would be very understandable for them. You're going to see something parallel taking the same way at the beginning of the century with Arius, the priest in Alexandria. He put his heresy into popular day jingles to make them come across. YouTube before YouTube. Of communicating, you know, it, the, the whole question becomes, how do you communicate? Communication is very important. So St. Ephraim, his poetry is part of his teaching. We mentioned that even when he was in Nisibis, he was Malphonum. He was named as teacher, catechist, in the church in Nisibis, and ordained as a deacon. Okay? So St. Ephraim is writing because he wants to make sure that he has the orthodox Nicene faith. We'll talk about Nicaea in a moment. This is the council, the first great council in the year 325. And so, of course, this is 50 years after. I know this is, this is Vietnam and us. This is the distance of a life. So St. Ephraim, he wants this orthodox teaching to be held by the people. And there was a lot of variations of what was calling itself Christianity. Okay, so there was a lot of confusion in Edessa. So it was, in a way, the apostolic fount of all Mesopotamia, but you had a lot of different versions and sects of Christianity taking place there. Um, one of the things also we mentioned is that in the end, he dies in 373 because there's a plague. And he dies taking care of the plague victims. And by this time, he's already about 70 years old. But he's also, he dies specifically because he catches the plague when he's taking care of trying to do the works of charity. He's known for his work of gathering in goods, blankets and things, and food, to be able to help redistribute. He's a deacon. So, I mean, that was what he did in the church. And so he was doing that, and in serving the people, trying to bring these aids to them, he, he dies of the plague himself. Um, because of all these different varieties of Christianity in Edessa at the time of St. Ephraim, the Orthodox Christians, the Catholics in the city of Nicaea, were often referred to as being Paluzians. If you say pollutions, it sounds a little horrible. So, <laughs> Palut, Palut, Palut was the, the, the bishop of Antioch by which orders episcopacy passed to Edessa. So, the first bishop of Edessa winds up being ordained by the bishop of Antioch, whose name was Palut. So, the people who hold on to that Western version of the Roman were known as the people of Palut or Palutsianoi. So the, that was the name they gave them. 
like even today, you know, they'll give us different names. So depending on if they hate you or not. So that's what they were referring to. It's just being the faction of Pavu. <coughs> that's how they just brushed it off. But of course it was Orthodox Christianity. One of the things that, that St. Ephraim is also known for is he wrote hymns specifically <coughs> for women's choirs. It's quite revolutionary in the sense that, you know, because in the churches, in the churches historically and well up into the modern era, the Renaissance kind of shifts it for the West. But in the East to this day, it is still absolutely the case, all the choirs are male because they're answering the altar. It's considered part of the priesthood. They're part of that responsory. So the fundamental choir block, your cantors are men. Nowadays, again, we do things in the 20th century differently. But historically, throughout all of this time, they were always male voices. Okay? Now we have things like, um, we have Russian pieces of mixed choirs and all that. We have the Vespers. So you have things that were done for larger compositions, but in the churches, it was always considered an exercise of the priesthood. So that St. Ephraim, St. Ephraim stands out quite specifically in the 300s because he wrote specifically for women's choirs. Now, we don't know where they actually served at. That's one of the questions. Because the hymns that they are singing seem to have been hymns meant to be for public presentation of the Orthodox faith. So, and also for the communities of women that existed. But St. Ephraim stands out for having distinctly organized and formed choirs that were only women. So, no, so this distinction. And this brings us to one of the major things that takes place through the Middle East. When we talked about Justin Martyr, we talked about one of the accusations that was against him in Rome, which made him leave Rome and go back to the Middle East, was he was being called an ekratites, the enkratism, ekratism. is from the Greek word meaning self-contained, possessing oneself, the enkrates. Enkratism was a movement in Christianity which identify, not identify, um, but made following the gospel also necessary to embrace celibacy. So encretism condemned marriage as being a consent, a, a condescension, or a, uh, a compromise with the flesh. And so in encretism, they, they were basically what we now would call shakers. Everybody in the Shaker movement embraces celibacy. Same thing here. So in encretism, encretism, they would also have embraced celibacy as obligatory to everyone to be a faithful disciple of Christ. What's fascinating about it, of course it's condemned as a heresy, but one of what's fascinating about it is how the people around, and again, remember the huge influence of John the Baptist upon the Aramaic people. To the point where you have a whole religion in the Middle East of Mazdaism, which comes out of, they claim, St. John the Evangelist, St. John the, 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 the forerunner. And so they still, they existed mostly in southern Iraq. I mean, they're pretty much being exterminated now. But lots of baptisms, lots of cleansing, lots of purification of water and all of these things. And so... The other group among distinctly the Middle Eastern peoples are what are known as Ebionites. And this word is not coming out of Africa. Ebi is the idea of the poor. And what they did is they made you and everyone embraced poverty. So, but they made it necessary for everyone to embrace the following of the Messiah, the, you know, this idea of poverty. They also basically were Jews who accepted Jesus as being the Messiah, but the Messiah is basically being the end of prophet that we're waiting for. This is going to have an influence, certainly, I haven't studied it, but I would guess 
this ebbing, this ebbing, ebionitism of the idea that Jesus is a great prophet, a great, he is the anointed one, he is the Messiah, but he's just a man, and the embracing of poverty behind it is probably one of these heterodox fashions which gives you in Islam that Jesus is a great prophet, born of a virgin, but just a man. So these are two major, this encretism, encreti I don't know, yeah, it's got an N in it. And this encretism and the Ebionites are two major movements. So I bring this up because the next thing, the last characteristic we want to talk about coming out of the Middle Eastern, the Syriac spirituality, um, is a contrast to what these are. These are heterodox forms of embracing celibacy from the kingdom of God and, of course, the renunciation of the world in poverty. Sell what you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. But as the fathers at the time, during these debates that went on in their interpretation, of course, what they brought up is saying, when our Lord tells that to the rich young man, it's not for his salvation, it's for his perfection. And to impose the path of perfection on everyone, that's never been the church's mission. They want everyone to be saved, but the idea of perfectly following the Christ is another question. That's why when the young man asked the question in the Gospel, he asked, what must I do to be saved? The whole debate goes back and forth with our Lord. And then we're told by St. Mark, he looks upon him and he loves him. It's the only time when we're told directly of that kind of an instance. So God incarnate looks on this young man and he says, there is still something missing for you. If you wish to be perfect, sell what you have, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. And we know that he's crestfallen, he doesn't like that answer, and he leaves, he walks away. Then our Lord gives the famous teaching by saying, I mean, amongst other things, but it's the famous line where he says that it's easier for the camel to pass through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's in response to this young man who walked away. Now, the church will just respond. It's very clear. This is a special act of love. This is a vocation for this young man if he wants perfection to follow in that. So to impose that on everyone who's baptized is simply wrong. Okay? And so that's why these, were, these eventually disappeared or mutated into other forms of religion. So like in Mazdi, whatever religions you had going on the, um, throughout the Mediterranean, th then they were usually kind of mixed up with forms of Gnosticism and things. So, you know. so the next one and the last characteristic that we wanted to talk about is what is known as the B'nai Kyomo. And the B'nat Kyomo. And certainly, St. Ephraim is one of the Bar Kyomo, Ben Kyomo. Probably you know this word most famously for B'nai Berith, the Jewish organization. It means sons of the covenant is all it means. So B'nai is sons. Kyomo. And we'll talk about this word. It's usually translated as covenant. But Berith is actually covenant. So it's not exactly the word covenant. Though often in the Syriac will be taken that way. And then you have the B'nat. Okay. The Bat Kyomo. The daughters of Kyomo. Mm -hmm. So as you mentioned, the singular of this is plural. This is plural. So Benai is a bar Kyomo. Baradom, son of man. Bar Kyomo would be an individual, one individual, as a son of the covenant. And the Bata Kyomo 
there's actually a silent R in here because the feminine, the feminine form just has a T on it. But it's pronounced as but. Right? So we see that when we have, um, at Christmas time, when we sing, Blessed are you, so the Kaddishat, right? Kaddishat, so you who were born of Bat Dawid, the, the daughter of David. Right? The fulfillment of the Messianic promise. All right, now, it's a very mysterious thing who these people are, the Benakimah. They're not the church, but they're part of the church, but they don't live separately. That's why it's also interesting that St. Ephraim is writing for the Bat Kiyomo, these women, but these women don't live in something that we would call a convent. These people are living in the community. So St. Ephraim living as a, this is the origin of the Syrian and the Middle Eastern ascetic movements. It, it doesn't come out of Egypt, even though, again, because of the Greek influence out of Constantinople, they always tried to shift the Syriac people to becoming more Greek. They always shifted it up to the point, of course, forming the Melkite Church, which is Greek in its liturgy, but the people ethnically are Middle Easterners. So it's the reason why St. Ephraim is portrayed as a monk, and the stories that will be told in his lives, lives, plural, hundreds of years after him, will make him be basically a Greek monk, who even meets St. Basil the Great, and who is ordained to the diaconate by St. Basil the Great, and you're like, hmm, no. But the idea is, is trying to bring them within the orbit. It's kind of like the West, the Romans doing the same thing, kind of, you know, stamping them in their own characteristics. Why it's important to understand these characteristics, because this is what's going to give you the ascetic movement out of which St. Marin comes. St. Marin is not a follow of Pacomius in Egypt. Marmarun is coming out of this ascetic movement of the Benai Kyomo. Which is why they're so different. The, Greek sh the, the, the Egyptians quickly form an organization around Pacomius and the Tebaid and everything in, in southern Egypt, or south central Egypt. Whereas these people are wild the whole time. The first time even the Maronites become organized is you know, 40, 50 years after St. Maron's death. Otherwise, they're individuals loosely associated together, and you get the open-air dwellers that will be St. Mary. You get men living on those columns. That's all these things that were done which were quite unusual. They weren't, they weren't, you know, they were different. But they weren't different for the sake of being bizarre, but the notion is that the individual is completely consecrated to following that path. And that path is going to be as individual as that person following it. Of course, the foundation is the gospel. They're following this path. But remember, asceticism doesn't mean, you know, I beat my chest with a rock. Asceticism means, ascasis is effort. I'm putting a serious effort into living my baptismal promises. Not everybody has to do it, but I am the ascetic. I am following with great precision. And this is the connection that we've talked about often from the pulpit in the Syriac tradition of the ihidioto, the singularity of vision, ihidoyo. Ihidoyo will be the adjective referring bro ihidoyo, the only son, the singular son, the unique son. Right? So the bro genizo, the hidden son, ihidoyo. So ihidoyuto is going to be the singularity of vision. This notion of, if you desire to be perfect, sell what you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. So at the point of baptism, we know, and it seems that what's taking place in the first and second centuries, and the third century, that people in entering the church, some of them would make basically what we would call a vow of celibacy at that point. And they would be known as the Benai or the Bat Kyomo, these men and these women. But they didn't go anywhere. They lived in exactly the same community where they lived before. 
but with the singular example of who they are embracing the gospel. There was no other distinction about them. They didn't do anything. They didn't go and, and lock themselves away someplace. They didn't go out into the desert. They lived in Edessa. Right? So it's quite interesting. So we know perhaps they were already organized in some way before, but St. Ephraim is writing then for these women, the Bat Kyomo. Now what's interesting we mentioned is Kyomo, so it's translated often as covenant. So I haven't put any words up here. Because one of the opinions about it is the, the word koma, what we make QM, Adam Messiah Koma. Right? So Koma, Meshiho Kom Men Kaburo, the greeting in Syriac for Easter. Meshiho Koma, the Messiah Koma, Men Kaburo, from out of the tomb. Right? Christ has risen. Kom is the idea of resurrection, of arising, of coming up. So you could also, and there are some authors who say, the Benai Kiyomo, has, they are sons of the resurrection. They wait for the day of the parousia. That is very much the Syriac spirituality. We don't have a single time in which in Mass we don't make explicitly a reference to when you come in glory to judge all men according and reward them according to their deeds. So there's the other interpretation as these people embrace immediately the idea of the parousia and, and make that ascetic life in order. It just means it's ringing in my kitchen. So <clears throat> the kyomo is the idea that they embrace that parousia of the day of judgment. And they are sons and they are daughters of the resurrection, of the rising. Be the resurrection of the dead, the day of judgment, the appearance of glory, the rising of God in glory. Who knows? But that's also one of the possibilities, which is quite beautiful on that spirituality. So that individually they embraced. They were all celibate. They're all celibate. They embraced that desire to follow that image in the gospel of perfection. The Benai Kyomo, the Bat Kyomo. And it's from this movement that gives us because at the same time when ascetic, the ascetic movements are taking place in Egypt in the 300s, they're also taking place in Syria, what we now call Palestine, that whole area. But they're not directly, I mean they're connected because they're all Christians, but they're not connected in the sense that the Syrians learned how to be monks from Egypt. Gaza and that, that's why Bar Sabas, Mar Sabas, St. Sabas in, in Gaza, these are important figures for us because they're part of the same Aramaic Mesopotamian vision. And so, as we mentioned, these men and these women seem to have committed themselves to that celibacy for the kingdom of heaven. We mentioned that it's also the Bat Kyomo, which are certainly the women's choirs that are referenced to, that St. Ephraim writes for. And the reason why this asceticism is important to the spirituality is because the vision in the Syriac world is that this movement towards perfection is a ladder, it's a steps, they're grad, it's, a, it's a gradation. The disciplined life is a series of steps, or a ladder of godliness, if you want. In fact, there is a 6th century book called the Book of Steps. It's a Syriac book. It's about this religious focus and, and asceticism in following the Lord God. So that comes in a little bit later, after this, shortly after this, but at the point when you've got, in the 5th century, your organization is becoming more, and that's why we see even Beit Marun being formed along the Arantes, bringing these open-air ascetics, these, the tradition around Mar Marun, and giving them a monastery. But of course it's the emperor that builds the monastery for them. So it's, it's a Constantinople to 
you know, the Hellenic influence giving them. And nothing wrong with it, it's perfectly good. But it's the idea, it's at that point in the 400s that you start developing, and at that point monasticism looks pretty much the same kind of movement everywhere. By that time, this, this fades out. Okay? It's the same way now among the Maronites, the religious orders are not Eastern monastics as they are in most of the churches. They've been reformed, so they're like Western Roman religious orders. So even if the superior is referred to as Archimandrite, he's actually a superior general just like in the West. So you have these influences that come, so they do in the 400s start forming more like what was in Egypt. Okay? We'll come back to this moment after you get a caffeine fix. And then we'll, there's a few more points on this one and then we'll talk a little bit more. Okay? But again, that whole question of the girls serving, that, again, like the choir, as we mentioned, historically, up until the end, you know, literally, Rome was like 1994, everyone was doing it from the, from that everybody. A lot of people, a lot of priests were doing it from the 70s onward, but it was never authorized. That's like communion in the hand. It was never authorized. It went on being condemned for about 10, 20 years, and then Rome said, okay, now you can do it. I mean, that, they, 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 Rome, Rome for the last 40 years has been leading from behind, which is part of the reason why we're in this shocking, scandalous situation that we are for these last four decades. That's why the intercession is we pray for the apostolic strength and dauntlessness and, and courage of the men. I was explaining to Steve, you know, in the traditional, our bishops wear mitres because of the Crusades. Our bishops, their head covering is the hood, the, the monastic hood, that's it. So after the Crusades, they start wearing this, this, this mitre. But the mitre actually used to be this way, with the horns coming up this way, and you had a tie string, like in a military helmet, underneath your chin. So when they turned it sideways, those strings became cloth, and they flop down the back of your neck. We call them lapets. That's where they come from. But in the tradition, up until the 20th century, the tradition that when you consecrated a priest as bishop, the imposition of that headdress on him had two symbolisms. One was the union of the old and the new covenant. That's quite straightforward. But the other one is that they must be champions of God and that these represent the horns to strike fear in the enemies of the Church of God. Now, so it's like a huh? so it's Oh, absolutely like along the same idea. Absolutely. And that was the idea. Is you are the champions. You are meant to be defending the people of God. It's why the cardinals wear red. Is not only do they have to defend the people of God, but they have to do so even to their blood. That's the reason why they wear red. It was meant to be their martyrdom. And we just haven't had that, I'm sorry, for the last 50 years or so. <laughs> and so they're all down there wringing their hands in Washington now, and I'm totally sympathetic, but hey, nobody dug this hole for you guys. So we might edit out this part, but... <laughs> yeah, but it's quite serious. Until, until they realize, you lay your life down. You know, the, success, the bishops of Rome, for the first three centuries, almost every single one of them was martyred for 300 years. So basically, when you were elected the head of the church in Rome, it was a death sentence, because they're going to arrest you and you're going to be killed. It's only in the, after the liberation of the church, in the th early 300s, that you finally have, okay, they can live, right? But... But that's the idea. This is why St. Paul says in his letters, I think to St. Timothy, or to Titus, he says, the one who desires oversight, over manageable, the episcopos, desires a very good thing. But you have, you have to realize it's because your oversight is to see to the well-being of everyone, not in dictating, but that everyone can function within that gospel. And you're probably going to die. And so, you know, forget about the chauffeur limousines and everything. You have a function, which is to oversee the body of God, the body of Christ, okay? So, when those are in position, we always do well. But every reform movement, every time of reform in the history of the church 
has always been because you return back to these perennial ideas of the gospel. And so, you know, sorry. How McCarrick ever goes 40 years when, uh, all, uh, so me too, me too, oh yeah, we used to go to the beach with him too. How does that happen with nobody knowing anything? It's just, you know, I, it, it makes me quite upset. You know? And now what it means is that everyone who catechizes or teaches or is a priest are just being tortured because now we have to be updated every single year, doing more videos and more tapes and more conferences and all this, and more certification. Why are we the ones? So the idea is, is that, you know, when they talk about the clergy, it's priests, deacons, and catechists, and then we're the bishops. Hey, you're part of the clergy too. <laughs> so that's why I think this is a beautiful idea, because these are individuals who at their baptism decide this is a serious affair, and I'm going to go the next step at my baptism. The church didn't impose it on everyone, and that's why I said these people lived in the same community. Now, we have no we have no other really ideas of did you did they wear something a little bit different? I mean they wouldn't wear a habit though we think about now. They didn't show up with the B-52 headdress on. But <laughs> did they distinctly wear what the poor were wearing? So the peasant dress? Because you know, we forget that for most of the history of the world, dress a lot of times in communities was, was legislated on. You could wear or could not wear a certain cloth depending upon what social class you lived in. So these were important. Clothes always had a great importance, right? You know, we chose in the 1950s to start wearing the proletariat dress of an undershirt and dungarees. But that was a distinct choice that we began to shift. Now we wear our pajamas. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, you mean when they actually wear their pants up at all? Oh, no, I'm just saying, you know, I mean, people just, Show up wearing their pajamas, you know, things that they're clearly going to be sleeping in, so because it's comfortable. And so, but the idea, you know, anyway, we're, we're not, this will get me totally off on a different. <laughs> but anyway, so we we pray for these poor men, but they're the only ones who can fix it. So anyway, but the example of someone like Mar Ephraim as being part of this and then giving an expression to this ineffable faith and this consecration, and then ecclesiastically as a deacon, dying while he does his diaconal thing, which is helping the poor, is a magnificent example. Everyone honors Mar Ephraim. Everyone. Greeks, Romans, Egyptians, Ethiopians, Indians, everyone honors this man. Which is pretty extraordinary, you know. And so it's, it's kind of a unique thing. But what I wanted to really kind of you know, hammer home tonight, which is pretty clear, is this notion of the spirituality of this ascetic aspect of the Bat Kyomo and the Benai Kyomo. Right? So these, uh, these men and these women. And that the idea of the spiritual life is that I have a vision of making steps of progress. Not just bobbing along, whatever's going to happen. Yeah, hey, you want to go to Mass this week? No, I'm not really, I'm busy. And so we just kind of, that's not spiritual. That's not following the gospel. The gospel is a conscious embrace of what God incarnate, the hidden son, the Messiah, has taught us. And we seriously embrace it. That's the act of faith. So when I, you know, in the pulpit when I say that the further we get from the mysteries, the further we get from the mysteries, is because eventually that ascent, that personal engagement with the Messiah, <coughs> evaporates. Why so many people have lost the faith. They may be baptized, but that's not the same thing as living <coughs> your baptism. Right? It's, it's, is it horrifying? Yes, it's horrifying. But it's a reality that we have to see. And it's not a new reality. It has always been here. In the persecutions of Diocletian, probably the majority of the church apostatized. Which is why it causes schism and unrest in the church for another 70 years after. Because the idea is, what do we do with apostates? What do you do with someone who's already been baptized and has renounced Christ before the authority? You can't baptize them again, so what do, you, what do you do? Is it just, you just leave them to go to hell? And it's a huge question. And it causes a schism in the church. It's the ovations. It causes this whole, and it causes eruptions of the church in Africa, North Africa. St. Augustine, right, in the 400s, is still dealing with it a century later. When we make choices, they always have effect. 
And so, when, you know, everything we choose to do has an effect both in eternity, that we do consciously, has an effect in eternity, and of course has an effect on the people around us. First and foremost, our children. And then, of course, by making our choices morally, it has this larger picture. Which is why the Benai and the Bat Kyomo is so beautiful, because these are individuals who show that seriousness of the individual embracing, and then the notion of the Book of Steps. That this is something which I'm going somewhere. When I embrace the Gospel, I'm going somewhere. I'm not just simply, that's why I always say over and over again, Christianity is not magic. It doesn't happen when we pour water on your head and you're just going to go to a happy place when you're dead. That's not Christianity. But that is how most people see Christianity these days. You know, it's tragic because if there's anything clear in the Gospels, our Lord is always asking for personal engagement. He who loves father, mother, brother, sister more than me is not worthy of me. Well, can you become more austere than that? It's telling you what the faith. So for the Syrian, that was the idea. <coughs> you can make the next step for the celibacy of the kingdom of God and embrace the parousia, the day of judgment. That's a sense of kyomo, the day of resurrection. Or you can continue on your life, but you're still, even if you're married, you're still going to have steps to follow. You may not be able to do them. Even St. Paul covers this question with the Corinthians. The person who is married is focused first on their spouse and their family. That's normal. Therefore, they cannot serve the Lord to the same degree of someone who's free. He's not saying marriage is bad. Marriage is beautiful and holy, and celibacy for the kingdom of God is better. I and mean, that's really the way it works. The problem with the Abionites and the Anchritists is they were saying that marriage is just bad because you can't focus on the Lord. It's like, well, that's not the teaching of our Lord. <laughs> <coughs> this great sense of determination and focus and vision and progress that we follow. And you can see easily then, in the Hellenic world, they pick up this idea of mending the soul, the therapeutic healing of grace. Who, in any kind of a medical world, who never followed the prescriptions, never did what the doctor said, would ever expect to be healed? And when they died, you know, when we have the great-grandfather who's smoking his entire life, knows, gets emphysema, then he has cancer, doesn't do anything, the doctor is, just curses the doctor and heals over dead. You're like, well, I'm sorry to lose grandpa, but you're also like, I understand why, you're, why this happened. If you don't follow the prescriptions, we don't follow the directions, which is what the teaching of the gospel, that's part of the announcement of what we're doing for the kingdom, you just don't have the effects that will come. And so the benign and the benign, the Bach Kyomo are very much on that. Which leads us into the next thing. This idea of the steps, or the ladder of godliness. This is never found as being mainstream. Or Christianity, the reason why this comes up is because Christianity never becomes mainstream in Persia, ever. You're always on the out. It's like the ages before Constantine. You as a Christian, you're on the out. You're on the out, you belong to an illegal organization officially, and some of you will get caught on occasion depending upon what the authorities think at this point. In time. <clears throat> when I was in Geneva for six years, technically speaking, it was illegal for me to wear my cassock, or even to wear a collar it was illegal, or for our sisters to be wearing any kind of religious garb. Since 1878, during the culture conf, during the, during the, the anti-Catholic persecutions of the 19th century. They didn't happen just in the Middle East, they also happened in Europe. You, know, you have a huge exodus of German Catholics during the middle of the 19th century for that reason. Why do you think the number one minority in the World War I were Germans, German Americans? Because they all kind of flowed over from the culture conf. Well, that same culture conf was picked up, even if they were French-speaking, they were Calvinist. And so it was illegal. And while I was in Geneva, we were the only ones, me, my two colleagues, we were always in our cassock, and five sisters in our convent. And then the, I think, the three or five Russian Orthodox priests. That's it. Those are the only ones out of, you know, a state of half a million people 
and you know a city of 180,000. So we're the only one. So when you see us around, you know. But there was even like three different newspaper articles that went on while I was over there about well, whether this should be an enforced law. Should this be enforced? Or should it be taken off the books? You know, these are active. This is only within the last 10 years. Yes? What would you have done? I would have gone to jail or paid the fine. Now, I can assure you that I, no, I mean, I don't talk this heated manner. I mean, I hope that God gives me the grace that if we ever came to that point, that, you know, that I would be able to hold it. I was and just I, curious. No, but we would have, but we know what's beautiful about it. And that's why part of we talked about the outreach last night at the parish council. One of the reasons why it's important that they see the face of Christ, which means that they have to see us and we have to be Christ. This is the other thing. Not just simply, you know, the really nice colleague that they work with. There has to be something in our lives which is different than everybody else. That's what happens, right? This is why martyrs exist in every generation, because you're different, and they don't like it. So we kill you. And so now you have a choice. You can either renounce it and be like the rest of us and be smart like the rest of us, or you die. Well, you have to be like Agnes and Agatha and, and Domnina <coughs> and the rest of these people saying, you know, in the Latin it's non possumus, we can't. We have a different vision of what the creation is. non postmus And that's why, and then you have these miracles of grace where St. Agnes, you know, at 12, 13 years old, they can't move her. They move her to take her off to the brothels. Because if you're condemned, you're condemned to become a slave of the Roman Empire. Well, I can assure you the Romans did not put people in, in prisons and then feed them for the next 50 years of their life. No, you were sent off in prison. And that's an important point to remember. Uh, for the rest of this little history. And you were made to work in the mines, or in the case of a 13-year-old girl, you'll be perfect for the brothels. The soldiers will love you. And you worked in the official brothels that belonged part of the Roman Empire's army. They just, you know, you have to remember, pagans dealt with sexual things like blowing your nose. You know, everybody needs it. You get married because you need an inheritance. You need someone that's clearly going to be able to take your possessions. And sex? Psh, doesn't really matter who it is. Men and women. I mean, we forget, I mean, we're going back to it now, but we forget how clear what the Christians, that they, they were living on a different planet, just totally different planet. Why do you think St. Paul, St. Peter in his letters refers to writing from Babylon, you know, the great city of destruction of human arrogance in the Old Testament? He's writing from Rome. You know, he's not admiring the architecture, though he may have admired it on its human level. But he's also recognizing what Rome did. And that's why even Augustus Caesar in the first century passed all these laws against adultery and everything because he had this romantic vision that when it was a republic, when we didn't have kings and that, when it was really the republic in the beginning, it was all upright and virtuous and noble and dedicated to families. Well, who knows? But that was his vision. And of course, for Augustus Caesar, the worst part is his daughter was one of the most flagrant people in the whole city of Rome. He actually exiled her at one time because of the fact he's passing these laws to try to, what he considered to be to reintegrate the family unit. And she's off running around with every guy she can find. And so, you know, none of these things are new. We think we live in a wonderfully new world, but it's not new. None of it's new. It's just new to us because we've been living in a Christian world for so many centuries. So, so this Persian idea of the benai kiln and the bab kiln, part of it is because the Pers in the Persian Empire, the gospel was never accepted. The Persian Empire never became Christian. They were always pagan, and then they became Muslims. That's it. Christianity existed. It was throughout the Persian Empire, but they were always the fringe element. And not only fringe element, but as I mentioned to you, we'll come back to, is that because the Roman Empire becomes Christian, now all of a sudden all of the Christians in the Persian Empire look like a fifth column, and they're suspect. No. They're going to show allegiance to Rome. They're going to show allegiance to the Roman Empire because the Roman Empire <coughs> was becoming Christian. Okay. So as we mentioned, the idea then of the Benai and the Bat Kiomo is they didn't go and move somewhere. They didn't go separately, like in Egypt, off into another place, into the desert. They remained alongside other Christians in the community, and the, not isolated, not separated from them,
But the idea of mentoring them, encouraging them, pointing a direction, because you see them, you go to mass with them, you see these people, and they're supposed to be a reminder of a different life. You know, back in the days when you, you know, the ideal, thought that every single sister or every single priest was, you know, great. But there was an idea behind the reality of being with everybody and the idea of being the encouragement. Of course, now we don't see religious anywhere now, so it's just, we just have this void where we just have to kind of do it on our own now. But this idea of these people consecrated was part of the idea of the gradations and being a supporting and encouraging aspect for the rest of the community. But as I mentioned to you before, even out of the Greek and used in the Latin, our word parish means strangers. It's, they're travelers. The word <coughs> parish means a body of travelers that we're not here. That's always been the vision of Christianity. It's just that some took it the next step of personally being clearly a traveler here. And the idea, if you were, you know, clearly personally committed to it, that idea of mentoring was is that you help the others also to stay on the road. Don't wander off down the hill. We have a focus. We are, that's why St. Paul says, we are co-citizens of the saints in heaven. That our, our patria, our fatherland is not here below. We don't get comfortable here. We keep moving, and right now we already have one foot in that world. That's the consecration. And we have a lot of people who individually spend the rest of their days after their baptism trying to yank the one foot out of that other place and just being normal like everybody else. But that's never been the Christian vision. If that had been the Christian vision, the Western world would never have been transformed. If the people themselves, you, you can't impose religion on people. But as the people change, they transform the culture because they saw the world in a different way. That's why the Western world became what it became. If, we, if, if our ancestors had lived like 90% of the present day Catholics, nothing would have happened and Christianity would have died by the year 900, quite honestly, if you look through history. But they didn't. They had a vision. We can only fix some things. And as you go through what the world wants to call the Dark Ages, it's a constant period of growth. Not by technology or invention, but by human transformation. And you keep moving. There's never any great steps in Christianity, both in the historical realm and in the personal realm, is a series of baby steps. And then once when you fall on your diaper and you get back up and you make some more baby steps. That's just the way it's always been. That's why it took well over a millennium to reach you know, the 1200s before finally we have this vision. And then there was immediate beginning of a collapse. We reached this pinnacle as a social Christian vision in the 1200s. And then from the 1300s onwards, it's just gradual descent. Okay? So it's very much connected to this idea of the benai and the batkyomo. And so the vision was they personally embraced this idea of being strangers and foreigners. People who live in a foreign land. This land, this is not what I was created for. I was created for the kingdom by my baptism. That is a stunningly beautiful vision. And if we keep that forefront in our minds, it changes everything in our lives. How we live, how we choose things, what we do and our future plans. It, ch it changes everything. But it's nothing other than the gospel. When, I, when our Lord says, he who's left father, mother, brother, sister, lands for my sake, will have a hundredfold in this world and life everlasting in the next. He doesn't say, leave everything and come and be miserable with me. He doesn't say that. The only time our Lord ever promises anything in this world, he promises to the ascetic who leaves father, mother, brother, sister, lands, for my sake, we'll have a hundredfold in this life and life everlasting in the next. It's the only time our Lord promises anything. Otherwise, the rest of it is, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Blessed are those who mourn. Because for the rest, if they haven't received that grace to renounce everything, leaving everything, including their lands for the sake of the Christ, which is what you have here, then the others, then it's most blessed to you when you're really suffering because you'll keep your eye on where you're supposed to be because you're being taught this is not your comfort zone because this or that is going wrong. 
Our Lord doesn't want misery. He wants us so that we learn to keep our eye focused upon the parousia. Yes, which is, of course, our, distinctly our spirituality. So then what does one do when they have responsibilities for other people? Well, that's the whole thing about St. Paul saying, right? Once you're, once you're engaged and you have family and spouse, your first focus is there. He doesn't say that's wrong. He says, but because of that, you can't serve the Lord directly. You do the best you can. But that's why he elevated marriage to a, a mystery. You know, it becomes the consecration of these two individuals, not just simply to bring another generation of, of children into the world and educate them, but to be Christ in the church. That's why in the East it's beautiful, because we crown them. They are consecrated, they are elevated for the first marriage. If you're a widow and you get married a second time, it's a totally different ceremony. You know, people get upset when I, I, I quote St. John Chrysostom famously. He said, marriage is saint, is holiness. Second time is indulgence. And the third time, he says, is for pigs. So. I mean, that's pretty, that's, that's pretty brutal in the modern world. But that's St. John Chrysostom. So, if you're, okay, marriage here, you get your crown. So you can see I've been living on a different planet because you've never heard these things. I no. told you. But that's St. John Chrysostom. Okay, so you're, you're crowned with the Maronite marriage, right? If your partner dies, you can get married again in the church. You're and about Maronite went. But you're not crowned again? No. <coughs> what is See, I don't know anybody that's ever been married twice in the church that's had that happen. I thought you could get crowned again. Oh, well, no, we're going we're gonna to have crowns. I realize we don't have crowns here. Right? Yes, we do. There's, all I can find is artificial flowers around. Is there metal crowns Didn't we, keep, didn't we keep the crown? No. Didn't we give them to them? I haven't found anything in this. Oh but you only are crowned <laughs> once, even yeah. if you get your because second marriage. Because that's your marriage. consecration as Christ in the church. It's why true. even in the Latin, in the Latin rite, I mean the Latin rite is much we more, crowns. you know, simple than that. But the Latin rite, there is a blessing, what well, was originally of the wife, and we call it matrimony. Matrimony literally means the office of the mother. When you call, when you talk about matrimony, you're not even referring to the guy. It's about her. She's she's now going to become mother of course, and the source right. of life. <laughs> so how's that? How's that for being you know anti woman You know. So that's what matrimony means, the office of motherhood. And so in the Latin rite, there was a special blessing before at the time of the Paternoster in the middle of the anaphora. The woman was consecrated through this prayer. I mean, of course, in the sixties we went, well, that's not really very fair. So it became a consecration of both the couple. Okay, fine, whatever. So we, we changed the words around. And we made it for both of them. But the idea was, is that's the consecration in her maternal state. And so, if, she, if he dies and she's widowed, that is her original establishment. So you don't give that blessing a second time to the woman. What if it's his first go around? There wasn't even, in the Latin, right, there wasn't even any specific right. blessing for the, for the groom. Right. Though I almost made... I had did one double wedding once. I mean, we're totally out of this with my notes. <laughs> <laughs> but you're but you're in but you're in the book. I mean, this is like when we get to the section on crowning. I mean, that's what we would be doing. And we'll probably do it again because God only knows it'll be a year, before, two years before we get to that section of the book. At the rate we're going. But <clears throat> what was the question now? So I did a double wedding. Oh, I did a double wedding once, and. and one of the young men had been a student of mine when he was in high school. I mean, you start teaching, you know, when I'm 25 and they're, seven, they're 16 and 17. And that wasn't a big difference. So. And, and there were two daughters, they were daughters, they were sisters of the same family. And their father said, look, if you're both thinking about marriage, I'm not paying for two parties. You're going to have, so it was the only time I've ever done it. You can do it, you know, you can do multiple weddings. And um, so I, and it was it was really quite stunning because that student of mine from high school, he was a very serious young man. And the sister that he was engaged to to marry, she was also much serious, much more serious than her sister. And the other sister was marrying the pretty boy. <laughs> the big brown eyes, the kind of sweet, you know. And I don't even know if they're still married now. But it was clear in the preparations of both of them. And on that day, that was the sermon. Today we celebrate the consecration of these two couples that they become not only reflections but also extensions of the mystical body of Christ for her 
and of Christ himself in this young man. Well, the pretty boy was like falling out of his chair and squirming and doing all that because he never thought about, you know, marriage is about sex, you know, we have fun together. And it's like, you're not thinking. So when I started talking about it at this level, the kid's just like, oh. <laughs> um, but, but, but the one who had been, you know, at the school where I was teaching, he, not only was he, not only did he already know that, he embraced it with full fervor and joy of having that responsibility given to him. Now that's what a Catholic marriage is supposed to be. We desire to, it is your day of ordination. And it has that, for the laity, it has that same importance. But it doesn't, that's what the church has done, is try to elevate what still psychologically is, well, I'm focused on my spouse and my children. I just want to have to do. You know? So I don't have the singularity of any of this, or of the priesthood, where the focus of the entire life is this ecclesiastical reality. I don't have that. So, so it's still true to say marriage is beautiful and wonderful, but I'm still occupied with changing diapers and, you know, and making sure there's food on the table. And so, um, but that's why Christ elevated, and it's something that was not in the Old Testament. Marriage was not considered this kind of extraordinary sacred thing in the Old Testament. I mean, now we like to talk about everything as being sacred. Human life is sacred, everything's sacred, everything. There's a, there's a distinction of a nature which is consecrated by grace and the mysteries which is a different vision. And so human life in itself is human life. It's beautiful, it's a reflection of God, and it's also wounded fundamentally by original sin. Sacredness comes in when you baptize, you consecrate, you transform. And now you want to be a vehicle for another generation of the children of God? Glorious. We will crown you as Christ in the church. That's the vision. I mean, now nobody gets married. They all shack up together. They live for a while. I mean, it's, it's a disaster. Everything is a disaster. <laughs> Where do you even start? I mean, you know, we start by personal individual conversion, which is why we're hammering this idea of the Syriac vision. God bless the Benai Kilmo and the Bat Kilmo. These people give us an example of what? They're in the beginning of the church. They don't have 2,000 years of history. They don't have a Sistine Chapel to go, oh, this is beautiful. Beautiful. They don't have any of those crutches culturally, psychologically, to say Christianity is true. They're making it true by the lives they live. And I'm afraid that we're returning very quickly to exactly the same situation. It will be true. And like I said, if everything, like I told you, in Kansas City, we have that glorious stone church, slate roof, red wood rafters, beautiful, stunning, the most beautiful place I've ever been. It's like a cathedral. We used to say, you know, Father, you have the longest, we had funerals, right? So the funeral directors would come and say, you have the longest church in Kansas City. It's so from the back, all the way up with the coffins, it just it took forever. But I used to tell them from the pulpit, as I mentioned to you, I mentioned them. I said, and if this church was gone tomorrow, would you be with me at Mrs. McGillicuddy's garage? Because it's the only place we have a chapel for. 1878, when you couldn't wear a collar or a cassock or anything? That's the same period when the Genevan government decided we're taking all of the Catholic churches in Geneva. They stole all of them. And under, under Bishop Marmiot, who couldn't even live in Geneva, but he was a bishop of Geneva, couldn't even live there, they formed what they called the chapels of persecution. And they were, they were peasants' barns. And they were lean-tos on the sides of sheds and buildings. And they did it. And they did it, and the Catholic faith still exists in Geneva. Because they did it. And in Ireland, too, they had to do outside. Yeah, those are the, those are the, but that went on for much longer. But yeah. I'm saying is that in Geneva, they took everything, every ecclesiastical property. That's happened, that happens frequently throughout the history of the church periodically. All right? So, so if they confiscated this tomorrow, would you be over in Steve's garage for Mass on Sunday? Yeah, yeah. yeah because he'd have a really nice brunch after. <laughs> <laughs> draft, draft his son. You're making brunch. I don't, if you don't come down to the garage for Mass, you're at least going to make coffee. So, yeah. Anyway, but that notion of strangers and foreigners is absolutely stunning. But this is part of the spirituality. It's that vision of why our prayers are always waiting for our Lord to come in glory. The end of the book of the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, finishes by repeating, Lord, come, let all of this happen now. The destruction of Babylon and the stars falling from the heaven. Bring us these convulsions because it means you will appear to us in glory. May it happen now. 
Who has that vision? Who has the desire that it all happen tonight at 10 o'clock? And if it happened tonight at 10, how many people will be ready for it? But that's exactly what our Lord says in the Gospel. He says, when I come, it will be like in the days of Noah. They will be given in marriage, becoming married. They will be at the markets. They will be doing everything. And the floods came and they're all drowned. Our Lord says that when I come, it will be like in the days of Noah. They're going to be inattentive, not paying attention. And when I appear in glory, that's, it's too late now. But our Lord himself says these things to us. And these people put it into action. It's not meant to be scare tactics. It's meant to be a vision of we weren't made to live in this, this kind of place. We have a much more beautiful destiny of light and of glory. Why would we even be satisfied with the stuff here, let alone distracted by it permanently? We get distracted periodically, of course. That's just human nature. We like our little sparkly things. We kind of wander up. Okay, no, I'm supposed to be back here again. I really need to be mass last week too, but um, you know. So that whole vision is clearly here in the notion of parish, travelers. Foreigners in this land. We only are here passing through. St. Paul repeats it. There's nothing, nothing specifically Syria. It's just that this Jewish Christianity picked it up immediately from the scriptures and have never let it go. So that while for Constantinople the vision is of the Christ in glory of the high priest who celebrates that celestial liturgy now before us in glory, or the Romans who celebrate the fact that the Messiah died for us and this is the precious blood being shed upon this altar for our salvation, that is also equally valid. But for us is that this vision of the mystery of the Christ who died and rose for us prepares us for the vision when it will all be definitively done. Maranatha, Maran, Maranatha, our Lord is coming. And that's why at the end of St. John's book of Revelation, it finishes that way. And the bride of Christ says, come, Lord. And the Spirit of God says, come. And then St. John says, you change anything in this book, may all the curses in this book come on your head. That's the end of the book. Loving St. John, that's what he says. Right? I'm telling you what is true. All right, so the Christian idea of the baptized developing in this Benai Kiyomo was probably in the late 200s and lasted throughout the 300s. So St. Ephraim is the perfect expression in that period of time. In the 400s, it starts becoming more Egyptian Hellenic, which is perfectly fine, but it becomes a different process, a different formation. Okay? Any questions on this? This meaning a huge amount of stuff I just threw up to you last afternoon. <laughs> it was wonderful. Well, thank you, but... Yeah. Mona? Yeah, it is so good to see you. We missed you. See you. How were St. Ephraim's writings heretical? No one ever considered them heretical. I thought that's what you said. No, in Edessa, there were a lot of heterodox versions of Christianity. Oh, okay. So he wrote so much of his poetry. Remember, we talked about Afrahat? who wrote his, his demonstrations, his expositions of the faith, which was more systematic. St. Saint, Saint Ephraim is really dealing with these heterodox versions of Christianity. No, St. Saint, Saint Ephraim is a doctor of the church. Thank you. And what's also important to understand is that Ephraim is completely aware of, you know, the, the Hellenic philosophical Greek tradition being used by St. Gregory of Nazianzen and St. Basil. He's totally aware of that, but he doesn't want to write that way. He wants to write in this essentially kind of scriptural, poetic way to express the ineffable. The Romans and the Greeks have always had the idea that somehow we can finally define this. And the Semitic world has ever said, no, no, we stand before the hidden one in awe and adoration. And so the poetry is dancing around something which ultimately is not definable. You know, which is why to ears who don't know it, it sounds redundant. But it's like Psalm 118. You know, it goes on and on. It's like the longest psalm. And it's all about, your law gives me strength, your law guides my feet. And it says the same thing in different little nuanced ways over and over again. People are like, oh, in the, in the old Latin tradition, that was the psalm that was so long, it was the one psalm recited. 
morning, mid-morning, noon, mid-noon, because it was so long, you just took sections of it and just made it part of the prayer for each moment. But people who don't understand that, they just go, it's redundant and it's boring. And one of the things we have to understand is that there's nothing boring in the church. If we don't, if we think it's boring, it's because we don't understand it. Everything, every single thing in Catholicism, well, maybe not the last 40 years, but everything in Catholicism up until the mid-20th century, all these major decisions have been done with a reason, and there's a reason behind it. It's a beautiful testimony we had from a young man who visited us a few weeks ago. He, talk, he talked about that whole movement of how when he was in his 30s, he just thought, well, why am I doing this? It's just kind of routine, and I don't really understand these things, and the Catholic Church has got to be wrong, and this, that, and this, and that, because it doesn't agree with me. But he realized that was a stupid way and a very immature way to talk about things. So he began to start looking into what the Catechism, what the Catholic faith actually taught, and why it taught it. And he, he told me, it was quite beautiful, he said, I came to realize that there is a reason for everything that the Church teaches. And it's like, bingo. And that's why it doesn't change, because there is a reason. You know, they can scream and write New York Times editorials, they can do whatever they want. I don't know if you saw the big one full page in the New York Times saying, now is your chance. All you people hang up on that stupid Catholicism, you see what they did in Pennsylvania, so just leave. Now, that cost twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars to do one page. So somebody invested a lot of money to tell Catholics, you're kind of stupid. But that's never been, you know, the church has always, she understands, the church knows, going back to that first point we can finish with, the church knows who she is. The members of the church may not know who the heck they are, but the church as an entity, as the body of Christ, knows exactly who she is. And it's why it doesn't, it doesn't shift. You, know, you can't say, well, we can change this, we can change that. There's a reason behind all the things that we do. Like when we were talking about the priesthood during the break. There's reasons for it. Any other questions? No, but St. Ephraim's a doctor of the church, one of the great thinkers and one of the great expressions of the Catholic faith. So. Okay, well, better than going into the third century history, we will stop now while we are ahead. <laughs> All right. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. O God, who are before all ages, and exist from age to age, you are resplendent and glorified in unsearchable light. Through your word, you bring forth light and give us each day. O radiant day, the source of all light, we glorify you, adore you, and come up for you praise night and day. Accept our praise and answer our prayer. Send us our soul and the mercy of your Messiah. To give him with you and the Holy Spirit, be glory and honor and honor. Without sin, pray, pray for us who have recourse to you. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Mm -hmm. So congratulations oh. for having weathered the storm this evening. Yeah. So it's very good to see you.